The Ben Shapiro Show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. I talk about them every single show. Why haven't you gotten a VPN yet? Get ExpressVPN right now at expressvpn.com slash Ben. Well, you may have noticed this morning that the stock market dived below 30,000. That is because Joe Biden's economic policy is really, really bad. Well, what is one way that you can hedge against really bad economic policy? Historically speaking, you at least put a little bit of your money in precious metals. And this is where Birch Gold can help you out. Birch Gold Group helps you hold gold and silver in a tax shelter retirement account to protect you from big government tyranny. Plus, throughout history, gold has always been your best hedge against inflation. A diversified savings can protect you from downturns in the market. If you have a 401k or an IRA that's underperforming, just text Ben to 989898. You can convert that into an IRA in precious metals right now. Birch Gold Group has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, countless five-star reviews, thousands of satisfied customers. Text Ben to 989898. Birch Gold will send you a free information kit on diversifying into gold tax-free. Take the necessary steps to hedge against inflation today. Protect your hard-earned money. Get your free information kit by texting Ben to 989898 right now. Again, you don't have to be subjected to the vicissitudes of the market in the same way you would if you just listened to Joe Biden. Instead, head on over to Birch Gold, text Ben to 989898 right now and get your free information kit to get started with Birch Gold. Also, this is a busy time of year for me. We've got Jewish holidays right around the corner. Got a lot of travel coming up, but I can rest easy because my home is completely protected. That's because I rely on Ring Alarm. I know what you're thinking. Wait, doesn't Ring do the video doorbell? Yeah, they do the video doorbell, but they also do an award-winning alarm system. That system makes available professional monitoring when you subscribe. Best of all, you can easily install it yourself. And Ring didn't stop there. They've changed the home security game entirely with Ring Alarm Pro, which is why I've decided to team up with Ring. When it comes to protecting my own home, I've gone pro with Ring Alarm Pro. Ring Alarm Pro is whole home security with available professional monitoring when you subscribe to Ring Protect Pro. Ring Alarm Pro combines a security system with a fast Eero Wi-Fi 6 router for home security and network security all in one device. Plus, with a Ring Protect Pro subscription, which is indeed an amazing deal, I get professional monitoring for the ultimate peace of mind. If anything happens, professional monitoring will call me and can request emergency services. So whether I'm across the country or across town, I know everything at home is protected and connected and that it will stay that way. To protect my home, I've gone pro with Ring Alarm Pro. You should do the same. Learn more at ring.com forward slash Ben. That is ring.com forward slash Ben. Well, the other day, Stacey Abrams, the failing Georgia gubernatorial candidate, opened a can of worms when she decided to leap into the abortion debate. Now, Stacey Abrams has been failing in this gubernatorial race. She's down somewhere between six and eight points, according to most polls, to Brian Kemp, the person she supposedly beat last time around. She didn't. She lost by 50,000 votes. And then the media decided to treat her as though she had actually won and they made her the president of the universe in the Star Trek world and, and all the rest of this stuff. Democrats treated her as the legit governor of Georgia, despite no evidence that she was actually robbed of the gubernatorial mansion. Well, now she's out there running a terrible campaign. And the, the sad truth is that Stacey Abrams is actually not that great a politician. And they, they keep trying to make Fetch happen. The Democrats, they have so many people that they've tried to make popular who they just can't make popular. Whether you're talking about Kamala Harris or Pete Buttigieg or Stacey Abrams, there's just so many people out there that they try to promote as just world beating candidates who it turns out fall flat, Beta or Rourke. There are tons of them. Well, Stacey Abrams is sort of 1A. She's exhibit 1A in this pattern. So during this gubernatorial campaign in Georgia, she has taken a photo of herself completely unmasked while all the kids behind her are masked and then had to apologize and explain that. And then again, over the past 48 hours, she said that basically ultrasound machines are a hoax, that ultrasound machines make up fetal heartbeats at six weeks. So here she was explaining that the fetal heartbeat is actually not real and therefore you don't have to worry about abortion. Now, in a second, we'll get to the science of what she's saying because it's just not true. But let's assume for a second that what she actually means is that a fetal heartbeat is when the valves open and close on the heart in a fetus. That starts happening around 10 weeks. Is she in favor of banning abortion beyond 10 weeks? I noticed not. So basically, as with most pro-choice rhetoric, it's all an excuse for, I feel like killing babies up until the point of birth. But here she was just misconstruing the science and adding on this very bizarre conspiratorial twist wherein ultrasound manufacturers are trying to deceive women into having their babies by showing them fetal heartbeat before a fetal heartbeat is actually present. There is no such thing as a heartbeat in six weeks. It is a manufactured sound designed to convince people that men have the right to take control of a woman's body away from her. Okay, this is crazy talk. It's a manufactured sound, according to Stacey Abrams. And not just as it manufactured, it's all a conspiracy in order so that men can promote pro-life positions. So it's invented by pro-life men in order to fake the sound of the heartbeat 
Okay, this is much more conspiratorial than anything Donald Trump has ever said about the 2020 election. Okay, this is really a wild, I mean, it's like up there with microchips are in the vax conspiracy level stuff right here. Okay, now, it happens to also be biologically incorrect. Put aside the conspiratorial side of it, just the biology of what she's saying is not true. Dr. Tara Sandler Lee, PhD, who studied heart development at Harvard Medical School and serves as director of life sciences at Charlotte Lozier Institute, responded, one wonders if Ms. Abrams was absent the day her health class covered human development. Even now, all it takes is one quick search of the public database of scientific and embryology research to confirm the heart is the first functioning organ in a developing human being, but the first heartbeat just 22 days after fertilization. A baby's heart is actively beating at six weeks gestation and will have already beat nearly 16 million times by week 15. In fact, at six weeks, when Stacey Abrams says a heartbeat does not exist, the baby's heart is actually beating at about 110 beats per minute. Most American parents have seen their babies beating heart during prenatal ultrasound and discussed it with their obstetrician. The mainstream media can perform Olymp Olympic level semantic gymnastics all they want. Most Americans instinctively, instinctively understand a developing human organ, which beats rhythmically and pumps blood throughout the body, is in fact a heart. So what the media have attempted to do, as we'll talk about in just a minute, is pretend that what Stacey Abrams is talking about is whether a valve in the heart, whether the valves in the heart open and close, because those, those develop slightly later. But the early fetal form of the heart has already developed by the time she is talking. And, and it's a very stupid point. I mean, if you're, if you're going to pretend that what actually a heartbeat is, is not a prenatal heart that is not fully developed beating, then you would also have to suggest, as they presumably do, that unless a brain is fully formed, which by the way happens when you're about 26 years old, that's when your brain really stops growing and changing. Up until that point, anything before that is just, you know, kind of pre-fulfilled pre brain function. It's too basic. It's, it's not really full brain function. So I guess we can kill you when you're like 18 years old, 17, 15. I mean, after all, you don't have full brain function. Your brain's still developing. This is not how this works. Peer-reviewed science on babies at six weeks gestation shows the heart is actively beating at six weeks. Between fertilization and birth, the baby's heart will beat approximately 54 million times. The baby's average heart rate is 110 BPM. This will rise to 159 BPM by eight weeks gestation. The presence of a heartbeat at 68 weeks gestation correlates with a live birth rate of 98% in normal pregnancies without any sort of intervention. And there are a wide variety of sources that have talked about all of this. Now, the media have rushed to try to clean up for Stacey Abrams by pretending that actually there is no fetal heartbeat. So Twitter, which again is the most biased news source in America, Twitter will find a, a trend and then underneath the trend to explain the trend, they will basically just put something written by Media Matters. Here's what they wrote about what Stacey Abrams said, quote, Georgia gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams said there is no such thing as a fetal heartbeat at six weeks of pregnancy. And doctors agree one doesn't exist during this early stage of pregnancy, reports from NBC News and NPR confirm. Abrams appeared on a panel at an event on Georgia in Tuesday, on Tuesday and discussed various state bans on abortion at six weeks. She said, quote, there's no such thing as a heartbeat at six weeks. Doctors and scientists speaking with NBC News and NPR confirmed that while a fetus has cardiac, cardiac activity at six weeks, a functional heart does not exist yet at this stage. Well, I mean, if it has cardiac, cardiac activity that's pulsing, that's what we normally call a cardiac heart beat. Cardiac heart beat. <laughs> you guys are working real hard to spin this one. Glenn Kessler over at the Washington Post also trying to clean this one up for Stacey Abrams, and he steps into a real pile of scientific horse manure. Quote, for what it's worth, fetal heartbeat is a misnomer. The ultrasound picks up electrical activity generated by an embryo. The so-called heartbeat sound you hear is created by the ultrasound. Not until 10 weeks can the opening and closing of cardiac valves be detected by a Doppler machine. Um, well, actually, no, that, that is not what an ultrasound does. Ultrasounds don't even detect electrical activity as the name ultrasound would actually suggest. Ultrasound is more like sonar. You're listening to sounds. You're not detecting electrical activity. Ultrasound machines are not capable of doing this. There, there is a, a scientist, a radiologist named Pradeep Shankar, and he pointed out ultrasound only detects density and motion. It cannot detect electrical activity at all. This is a scientific fact. It's from a radiologist. It is true that the valves in the heart develop later, but cardiac muscles that are located in the embryological heart are contracting. They are, in fact, moving inward and outward. That is how you define a beat. He says the cardiac tissue is contracting, which is literally what a beat is, to say otherwise is scientific misinformation and cannot be treated otherwise. So... Again, the, this, this bizarre notion that you can just spin this away. There's no such thing as a heartbeat. Literally, the National Institutes of Health, quote, baby's heart continues to grow and now beats at a regular rhythm, weeks six to seven. How bad was this, all, all the cleanup? It was so bad that Planned Parenthood had to walk this one back. Okay, Planned Parenthood on their own website said just months ago, quote, a very basic beating heart and circulatory system developed during the fifth to sixth week of pregnancy. This is abortion mill Planned Parenthood. but 
Planned Parenthood later amended its website to more closely reflect the pro-abortion messaging against heartbeat laws. Because again, people tend to think that if there's a beating heart there, then pretty obviously this is a human being that is not you. It's not just a polyp inside your uterus. Now the site says a part of the embryo starts to show cardiac, cardiac activity, which is a, a very uh, roundabout way of saying that there is a fetal heartbeat. NBC News in May reported that experts say the term fetal heartbeat is misleading and medically inaccurate. But the doctor, the article from NBC News months ago goes on to quote a doctor who says the heart does begin to develop at around six weeks, but says at this point, the heart, as we know, it does not yet exist. Again, if the argument is that full development of the heart as in adults is necessary in order to count it as a as a fetal heartbeat, then presumably the same thing would have to be said about brain development. And we know very clearly that early brain development in children is a lot more rudimentary than it will be as an adult. Are you allowed to kill kids two years out of the womb unless you're Peter Singer from Princeton University? He actually says yes. He says, because these are not fully developed human beings. You can, you can actually kill kids post-birth. If Democrats want to play this game, they're going to win some stupid prizes. But this is in the nature of what Democrats have to do. When reality runs in the face of their actual philosophical positions, reality must be ignored or called disinformation. So Kamala Harris yesterday, the vice president of the United States, she was out there again attacking crisis pregnancy centers. In other words, places that help women with their pregnancy, but encourage them not to kill the baby. Which last I checked is actually a good thing. Like you're having a problem with your pregnancy. You don't have enough information. You need support. And these crisis pregnancy centers come and provide it for you. You go to them and they provide you the kind of support that you need health-wise and tell you not to kill your baby. She would prefer that you go to the place where they tell you to kill your baby. And none of it's really a big deal. That's not a fetal heartbeat. That's just some weird cardiac activity stuff happening over there. Well, ah, it's not a fetal heartbeat. So here is Kamala Harris calling crisis pregnancy centers disinformation. Again, this is the same party that will suggest to you that basically a fetus is a cluster of cells up until a woman randomly chooses that it's not a cluster of cells, at which point it becomes the most beloved object in her life. I met with many of you in my office at the White House, and we discussed the innovative strategies that you have used to defend women's reproductive freedom. You are taking on, rightly, the crisis pregnancy centers launching public education campaigns, because I don't think I have it here, but I'll show you all a map of the United States right now in terms of the patchwork of different laws in different states on this issue and the confusion it is creating and the need then for some of the most trusted elected officials to clarify the state of the law and in the midst of the vast amount of confusion, the need of you as the truth tellers to sort out fiction from fact and combat misinformation and disinformation, oh, disinformation, which we all know often creates a situation that is ripe for predatory practices. For predatory practices, wow. Misin by the way, notice how they can now conflate misinformation and disinformation. Remember that time in 2016 when they said Russian disinformation changed the election and then they shifted the language. Now they call it misinformation. And now they just say the two Simultaneously, misinformation and disinformation. Typically, disinformation means there's some sort of foreign source promoting propaganda that is false. Now she's basically saying that there's purposeful misinformation and disinformation. They are the same thing. Uh, essentially, you're a traitor if you believe a pro-life point of view seems to be the implication here. Or you're a liar. And it's just a good thing that you have people like Kamala Harris out there nodding at you with a weird hand motion and her slightly nasal voice telling you what the truth is about fetal development. Man, they are, they are truly bad at this. Speaking of people who are truly bad at this, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, Tita Clacken, she was out there explaining that if you actually believe in the pro-life position, this means this is like repealing the 19th Amendment. You know, the one that says that women can vote. It's like that. If you say that women should not kill babies in their womb, that in fact, the height of human existence is bearing children, which it is. If you say that, then this means that you hate women and you want to repeal the right to vote, says this very, very good Catholic woman who's so Catholic. Here she goes. And didn't he also be part of a, a, motion, a, a movement to repeal the 19th Amendment for women to have the right to vote? What do I think of that? I think I hear something like that every day around here. When my people say that women shouldn't be able to make their choices about contraception or their own reproductive health, that's a sign of disrespect for women. Oh, so just like removing the right to vote. Now, I noticed that the 19th Amendment was actually passed in, um, in the year 1919. 
And I noticed that Roe versus Wade happened in 1973. So for during that, that, that entire intervening period, apparently the same thing, the same thing, aborting babies and letting women vote, the same thing, according to Nan. I mean, she should remember this better since she was there in 1919. She was 40 then. And, and, and she was wearing dentures at that point. Those wooden teeth are still, are still in there. In any case, there is a great irony to the fact that it, it, it really is a striking irony to how the left likes to treat the unborn. The way that the left treats the unborn is they are completely disposable up until the point a woman decides that they are very valuable, at which point this is the most valuable thing in a woman's life. That, that, that switch just flips. And suddenly, magically, we're also, again, this is all about the idea that you define reality within yourself. Reality is not an objective metric out there. It's not something for you to discover. It's not something for everyone to be able to agree on. Reality is just defined through the prism of you. So if you look at that baby and you say to yourself, that's not a baby, we're all supposed to go, you know what? She says it's not a baby. It must not be a baby. And then the minute you say it's a baby and I love it. Oh my God, that's, that's amazing. Congratulations. You see this in every headline from the celebrity driven media, right? When Kim Kardashian is pregnant with a baby and she's like, oh, I'm pregnant. This is, I'm so, I'm, I'm in love. I'm already in love. Ah, like, oh, that's amazing. And she's like, I would like to abort. Like, that's, that is just a woman's right to choose. That is an incredible thing. The media have the split all the time, right? The same NBC News that is running segments explaining that there is no fetal heartbeat at six to seven weeks are also running show, uh, are also running segments on the Today Show admitting that the preborn can react to things like flavor. And they react to the flavor of food, which we've known, by the way, since like 2013. This is not new news for anyone who actually watches the, the science of embryology at all. I mean, we've known about how sophisticated fetal development is for decades at this point. The left just likes to ignore it because again, if we ignore the reality out here, then we can pretend that you get to define reality from in here, from in your heart, which is fully developed because you're an adult. Here we go, NBC News admitting that um, the preborn exists here. Look at this. So researchers in Brit Britain wanted to know if babies in the womb react when the mom ingests a flavor of food. And this is what they saw. Do you want to guess what was on the left? Oh. So the left is a, a baby in its resting state. Okay. And then on the right, you see how he smiles 20 yeah. minutes? The mom ate some carrots. Aww. On the left, would they? That was just a resting seat. That was a resting, but, but he right. liked or, the carrots. She had like a oh, carrot pill. So were there other foods? Yes, there were other foods. I'm glad you asked. You want to look at this baby's sure. reaction before? <laughs> mom, had, mom had kale. Wow, wow. So here's the thing. The what about if mom had had ice cream? I don't know. Why, why, why would they go? Why would they go with? Let me with explain. And vegetables. So the SETI's co-author says the images could just show muscle movements when a baby's reacting to maybe a flavor that's bitter. So you shouldn't interpret it whether you know it's happy or distaste. No, I think that's how I do. It. Yeah. <laughs> because once they get out of the womb, it's that same look. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, it is. Wow, you've discovered the pro-life position, guys. Congratulations. Now, they'll be walking this back as soon as possible, right? Because the baby in the womb, they don't actually give the age of that baby in the womb. That looks like that, that baby in the womb is maybe eight months, seven, eight months. Okay, but they all believe, I guarantee you, that entire panel believes that if a woman decides that's not a baby and wants to abort it, boom, you can do it. Because woman's right to choose. You cannot hold those two thoughts simultaneously. You cannot. And so you have seen this from the media. What they like to do is fact check things that don't exist. So for example, the Washington Post did a fact check on the quote unquote, right wing talking point that Democrats are fine with abortion until point of birth, which they are in their platform. The way they fact checked this was by saying Republicans imply that this happens all the time, a nine month abortion. No, that's not what we said. We said that ideologically speaking, you guys seem to be fine. And you have said that you're fine with abortion up until point of birth, no restrictions whatsoever. And so they don't want to fact check that because it's true. So instead they fact check an implication that nobody actually said. By the way, they would never do the opposite. Right. When the left says, well, you know, you you Republicans, you you say that that in, in cases of rape, that a woman should should bear the child. You say that they that happens to be true. Right. I mean, the pro-life position is that the evil of rape does not justify the evil of abortion. Two evils don't make the original evil go away. Okay, But you never see the left fact check that statement by saying you seem to be implying that pregnancy from rape is a wildly common occurrence. And statistically speaking, as a Matter of fact, it actually is not all that common. They never do that, right? It only works one way. And the media spins so hard on behalf of the left that they end up defending things that are, that are actually not even remotely science. And then they ask us to believe that these are the scientific experts, that these are the people that we ought to listen to. And this holds true across the board. It was true when it came to COVID, when we were supposed to listen to the experts, despite the fact you could read the studies yourself, when the experts would say things like, a cloth mask is going to prevent Omicron, which there was absolutely no evidence for, you were supposed to believe that. You were supposed to believe it when the experts would go out there and say, yeah, your child may die from, from COVID. 
even though the stats were showing that children were more likely to die of pneumonia than COVID. You're supposed to believe it when they say that boys can be girls and girls can be, hey, the experts say, the experts say that if you chop off a, a pubescent boy's penis and you form a fake vagina, he will be happy the rest of his life if he believes he's a girl. You're supposed to believe that despite lack of all evidence because they're the experts. And so when they just tell you things, you wonder why you've blown out the credibility of science. This would be the reason. We'll get to more on that in just one second. First, let's talk about the fact that the value of your minivan, pickup, sedan, whatever it is you drive, probably actually appreciated significantly over the course of the last year. And now with the possibility of microchip shortages and the possibility of moving away from gas-powered vehicles entirely, that car might only get more valuable. So why would you let it break down? You shouldn't. Instead, you should head on over to rockauto.com to get all the parts you need to maintain and repair your vehicle. Rockauto.com has been in the auto parts business for 20 years. Family owned, their goal is to make auto parts available and affordable and keep you safe on the road. They not only have the auto parts you need, they will give you a selection of trusted name brands to choose from. You can pick brakes that match how you use your vehicle for towing, racing, or just commuting to work. You can get suspension, exhaust, air conditioning, and other kits that provide all the parts you need for a successful repair. The rockauto.com catalog, it's remarkably easy to navigate. You can quickly see all the parts available for your vehicle and choose the brands, specifications, and prices you prefer. Chain stores have a lot of different price tiers for professional mechanics and do-it-yourselfers. That is not the case over at rockauto.com. Their prices are the same for everybody. Head on over to rockauto.com. Get brakes, shocks, carpet, wipers, headlights, mirrors, mufflers, lug nuts, or any other part you need. That's rockauto.com. Be sure to write Shapiro in there. How did you hear about us box? So they know that I sent you. Also, it is worth noting that this has been a particularly tough time to hire great people. Right? The labor market is really, really rigged right now. I mean, it is difficult to find the right people. This is why you need ZipRecruiter. So you can find people to edit your show like Adam. Adam was brought to us via ZipRecruiter and he edits the show. He makes it look like magic every single day. You can find your Adam over at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter does the work for you. ZipRecruiter uses its powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. You can easily review these recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within day one. No wonder ZipRecruiter is the number one rated hiring site based on G2 satisfaction ratings as of January 1st, 2022. Right now, to try ZipRecruiter for free, my listeners can head on over to ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E. ZipRecruiter is indeed the smartest way to hire. Head on over to ZipRecruiter right now and try it for free. Again, at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire to get started and find the best employees for your business. And again, this is part of a, a broader left-wing push that suggests that everything in life can be redefined. Reality itself can be redefined around what you feel. What you feel is the only thing that matters. And you have quote unquote scientists who are promoting this crap on an ideological level, pretending that what they are saying is science. So for example, on the trans issue, you may have noticed that there's been a lot of talk recently about the transing of the children in places like Vanderbilt University Medical Center. It's something that my friend Matt Walsh has, has talked extensively about. There's lots of evidence showing that they are giving puberty blockers to minors, that they are performing surgeries, gender reassignment surgeries on minors and all the rest of this kind of stuff. And then if you question this, then you will see people say, well, you know, WPATH, WPATH, they are the ones who set the standard. WPATH knows this is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Well, as you may have noticed, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health is a left-wing activist group. And they, they promote the most extreme versions of non-science on a routine basis. WPATH is not a scientific group. It's an ideological group masquerading as a scientific group, which is why, for example, as Wesley Yang reveals during their 28th annual symposium, which was held between September 17th and 20th in Montreal, they had a presentation by Thomas Johnson, a professor emeritus of anthropology at California State University, discussing a chapter in the new standards of care for WPATH. It, it designates those who identify as eunuchs suffering from male to eunuch gender dysphoria as subjects with a need for gender affirming care as part of a gender diverse umbrella. Johnson did a full presentation for WPATH. He's an anthropologist about why eunuch is a new sexual identity. And there are people out there who just need their balls removed. That's what really needs to happen here. Johnson also happens to be the author of an op-ed published in the Washington Post in 2014, encouraging ISIS to actually promote eunuchism I'm not kidding. He wrote an article in the Washington Post titled, Islamic State Lacks Key Ingredients to Make a Caliphate Work. Unix. That's a weird take. He said in that particular piece, quote, all previous caliphates relied on a special class of bureaucrats to provide stability and statesmanship. Those were eunuchs who were unable to impregnate the women sequestered in the palace. Eunuchs were without family and dependent upon the caliph for support. 
For four millennia and through many different Asian empires and caliphates, eunuchs proved themselves to be efficient governors. Their presence was, again, a sign of power and authority of the rulers. It says, while it's been less than a century since the fall of the Ottoman Empire, it's clear that a key concept for continuity with the great caliphates of the past has been lost. So uh, uh, amazing stuff there from Thomas Johnson. He did an entire presentation for WPATH about the standards of care for eunuchs. Not kidding. He talks about eunuch is the oldest recognized gender outside the binary. Castration was an important discovery for domestication. The first documented production of castrated slaves was about 2100 BCE. They soon found roles in government. I'm sure that, that many of these people were just like, they, they hit 15. They were like, man, these balls are useless to me. I'd love it if you could remove them so I could become a bureaucrat and, uh, and keep watch over the caliph's harem. Voluntary eunuchs, according to Professor Johnson, were part of the Assyrian bureaucracy. Even members of the royal family were castrated. It was a route into bureaucracy or religious hierarchy, even military and district administrators. It was frequent in early Christianity, including several patriarchs. How magical. And this is what W. Path is saying. W. Path had a full presentation. Again, this is the standard of care for transgender health, according to our media, our, our elite media. This professor did a presentation saying, quote, rest, again, this is over at Wesley Yang Substack. You can read the whole thing. Quote, who seeks voluntary castration? Biological men with extreme gender dysphoria. They desire to be not male, but do not wish to be female either. Others have an oppressive feeling their genitals are not a proper part of their body. They fit a body integrity dysphoria diagnosis. Or it could be an extreme fetish or paraphilic disorder. There are a wide variety, but most common is religion-based. So obviously this is, this is the next step. We need to, if a child identifies as a eunuch, probably we need to start deballing the children. That, that is definitely the thing that we need to be doing. In the name of science, of course. You may have noticed that the science and the activism here seems to be crossing streams. That science is now dictated by an extreme atomistic individualism that denies the presence of outward reality. And if you notice, then they call you a bigot. This, by the way, is happening in schools. Do you, you notice how fast the movement for gay marriage went from, we just want to be left alone in the privacy of our own homes, to we need to teach your children that all forms of sex are equally moral and also that they can be members of the opposite sex? That morphed super fast, did it not? And there's a lot of talk about, well, the slippery slope argument, that's nonsense. Yeah, the best graphic on the internet these days is a graphic that shows the slippery slope, right? It looks like a slope that dives off, nose dives off a cliff. And it says, the slippery slope argument is false. And there's an arrow that points to the bottom of the slippery slope and says, you are here. Yeah, that's where we are. So Chris Rufo has a report over at his Substack talking about a teacher's union nationwide titled the LGBTQ plus caucus. They have now created a website and badge for public school employees that promote non-binary identifies, not non-binary identities, a how-to guide for queer sex, and the idea that transgender men can get pregnant. According to local reports, the National Education Association and its local affiliate in Hilliard, Ohio, have been providing staff in the Hilliard City School District with the QR code-enabled badges, which point to the NEA LGBTQ plus caucus website. It's all part of the National Education Association, which along with the AFT, those are the two big teachers unions in America. And they include resources from gender activist organizations, including Scarletine, Sex, Etc., Gender Spectrum, the Trevor Project, and Teen Health Source. One of those linked resources, Teen Health Source's Queering Sexual Education, which promises to empower youth, includes a how-to guide for really important things for the youth. Right? We have to teach the youth. After all, this is science, guys. And science is about sexual identity because that's really the most important part of you. And the realities of life and sexual development and morality, and these, these things do not exist. The only thing that matters is how you, and we are going to teach you that sexual fluidity and that sexual profligateness, these are the, the true pathways to happiness. This is what the science says. It's, what the, it's not ideological, guys. It's what the science says. So what exactly is the how-to guide? Well, it teaches students how to perform anal sex bondage, rimming domination, sadomasochism, muffing, and fisting. The materials are extremely graphic, explaining how to, for example, put a fist or whole hand into a person's vagina or bum. The NEA is the largest teachers union in the country, representing more than 3 million public school teachers in all 14,000 local school districts. And it has been captured by radical gender theory, says Chris Rufo, and its perverse ideology. That, of course, is exactly right. All of this, again, is about taking over cultural institutions and seizing them on behalf of an ideology that tears down traditional institutions and roles. That is what this is. And, you know, the, the best evidence of this is what's currently happening in the military. So yesterday, John Kirby, who is the spokesperson for the Defense Department, John Kirby was asked 
on Dan Abrams Live about the quote unquote woking of the military, the fact that there's now equity training being done in the military, the fact that we're now su supposed to pretend that that men can be women, women can be men in the military and public is supposed to fund those surgeries and all this. And, uh, and John Kerry's like, there's no wokeness in the military. None of this is woke. This is just normal. It's a bogus claim. There's no wokeness in the military. The military is by, and it should be, a diverse organization. We're supposed to represent and defend all Americans. And our diversity, and I've seen this myself firsthand, aboard ships at sea, the diversity of the United States military makes us stronger, it makes us smarter, helps us make better decisions. There's no wokeness. This is a, this, they're driving a stake through a straw man. Um, so there's no wokeness in the military. Also, the thing that makes the military the strongest is not military read readiness, efficiency, objective metrics. What makes it stronger is diversity. But there's no wokeness in the military, says John Kirby, before providing a pretty good definition of wokeness in the military. By the way, according to dailywire.com, Biden's military is now telling people in the Air Force to stop using words like mom and dad. Because after all, we wouldn't want to offend any. There's no wokeness in the military, though, guys. No wokeness in the military. These traditional roles, the traditional notion that mom and dad are a good thing and that a child should have a mom and dad. When did it become controversial to suggest that a child deserves a mother and a father? If you deprived a child of a mother or a father, this would make you a child abuser. Okay, but in our society, we have decided that, that mother and father are no longer words that can be said because there are too many kids who have been brought into families who don't have a mother or father. And after all, we can't pretend that there is a superiority of having a mother and a father over having two dads, two moms, three moms and a chicken. It doesn't, none of that matters. It's all equally, it, it's the same. It's the same, exactly the same. According to... Daily Wire, in yet another indication of how wokeness has permeated the American military under the Biden administration, Air Force cadets have been instructed not to use gender-specific terms like mom or dad. They've been told to replace such terms with words like parent or caregiver. That instruction was featured at the Air Force Academy in Colorado as part of the diversity and inclusion training. Yes, there's no wokeness in the military except for the DEI training over in the military. The New York Post reports that cadets were told our leaders have determined diversity and inclusion is a war-fighting imperative. Is it though, truly, is a war fighting imperative pretending that moms and dads don't exist and that everybody's a parent or caregiver? Again, I make a joke every single Father's and Mother's Day that it's either primary caregiver of unspecified gender or secondary legal guardian of unspecified gender. Every single Mother's and Father's, people are like, why do you keep making that joke? I keep making the joke because you guys don't get to pretend that you care about Mother's Day or Father's Day when you don't actually believe that we can celebrate mothers or fathers, qua mothers or fathers. It's amazing. Representative Mike Waltz Green Beret told Fox Digital, it's been a tradition in the military to get letters from mom or dad or your boyfriend or girlfriend for as long as there's been a military. Now we're instructing every cadet entering the Air Force not to say mom and dad, not to say boyfriend or girlfriend. Again, the, the idea that this somehow makes military readiness better is an absurdity. It's an absurdity. Because guess who tends to fight wars? The people who tend to fight wars are typically very patriotic, very male people. I mean, I'm sorry to break it to you, but this has been the truth about military warfare for literally all of human history. And the institution of traditional masculinity has been core to that idea. But we're a society that doesn't believe in traditional masculinity. Traditional masculinity is an opponent because traditional masculinity requires roles. It says that men are supposed to protect, men are supposed to defend, men are supposed to be strong, men are supposed to be fathers and husbands. These are apparently very bad things now. You're not supposed to say these things because these things are restrictive. And as we all know, True human happiness is to be found without any restrictions. Roles must be exploded. All cultural icons must be taken over. All traditional masculinity must be discarded in favor of a, a kind of unicized masculinity that denies the reality of duty, denies the reality of manhood itself. That is the goal, right? It's, it's, it's why there's so much emasculation in, pub, in, in popular culture these days. It's, it's, it is why our popular culture basically says that men who pursue women are the baddies in movies now. But all sorts of sexual profligateness of, of every other sort is the ultimate good. It's a pretty amazing thing. Well, folks, tonight we are releasing a brand new show for you. It's called Breakaways with Allison Williams. You remember Allison? She was a reporter for ESPN, and she was forced out of her job because she refused to get vaccinated. She was pregnant at the time, and she'd already had COVID. They fired her anyway. Well, now she's over here. Allison sat down with athletic iconoclasts who took a stand for their beliefs. The first four episodes feature Jonathan Isaac, Nick Rolovich, Enos Cancer Freedom, and Dana White. Those episodes will be available tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern, 
or additional episodes are coming soon. Head on over to dailywireplus.com right now to become a member and watch the series tonight. You asked for us to get into sports and we have done so. So go check that out at dailywireplus.com. Also, in case you missed it, last night was a brand new episode of my book club, Ben Shapiro's Book Club. You can watch it now on dailywireplus.com. We discussed all the King's Men, the best American political novel ever written. Next month's book, is Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. My notes for it are available right now. You have to be an all-access member to join in on the fun. And one final note, this coming weekend, we're releasing a new episode of the Sunday special with the Babylon Bees, Seth Dillon. Here's a bit of the trailer. Check it out. We're criticized often for having jokes that are too believable. You're, you know, it's like, well, this is the problem. It, it amounts to misinformation because people are believing that your jokes are true. It's like, well, whose fault is that? Is it the satirist who's trying to like stay a step ahead of the truth or is it reality for bumping up against satire? Seth is a blast. One of the funniest people in America. You're going to love it. Head on over to dailywireplus.com. Become a member today. Watch all of this amazing content. Okay, so meanwhile, central banks everywhere across the world, except for Turkey, because the Turks are, are trying to run directly into the teeth of financial pain, apparently. Everywhere, central banks are now raising the interest rates because they understand that if they don't, inflation is going to eat up their economies. According to the New York Times, a day after the Federal Reserve lifted interest rates sharply and signaled more to come, central banks across Asia and Europe followed suit on Thursday, waging their own campaigns to crush an outbreak of inflation that is bedeviling consumers and worrying policymakers around the globe. Central bankers typically move slowly. That's because their policy tools are blunt and work with a lag. Well, I'm glad that we finally realized that the central bank should not be the first stage of policy. It should be the last stage of policy. But that only came after, you know, legislatures throughout the Western world decided to abdicate their responsibilities to central banks. The interest rate increases taking place from Washington to Jakarta will need months to filter out across the global economy and take full effect. Jerome Powell once likened policymaking to walking through a furnished room with lights off. He goes slowly to avoid a painful outcome. But officials, learning from a history that has illustrated the perils of taking too long to stamp out price increases, have decided they no longer have the luxury of patience. So they are now radically and aggressively increasing those interest rates. The margin of error now is very thin, said Robin Brooks, chief economist at the Institute of International Finance. A lot of this comes down to judgment and how much emphasis to put on the 1970s scenario. In the 70s, Fed policymakers did lift interest rates in a bid to control inflation, but they backed off when the economy began to slow. And this led to serious stagflation, significant levels of unemployment, significant levels of inflation. The misery index was put together during this time to measure exactly that, the unemployment plus the inflation rate. You could see something similar if the Fed moves too slowly, which is why they're now moving more aggressively. Well, Democrats in the United States who have helped bring all of this about, they are just pretending that none of this is happening. So, for example, Corinne Jean-Pierre, the wildly untalented press secretary for the president of the United States, she was on The View to the applause of her sycophants. And uh, she refused to acknowledge, for example, that the Inflation Reduction Act has nothing to do with reducing inflation, which it clearly does not. I mean, it has nothing to do with reducing inflation. While we are talking about lowering prices, we have Republicans out there who didn't vote for the Inflation Reduction Act. No. They didn't vote on it. They're but bragging yet, about it a lot right now. They're though. bragging about it in Is their state. Is that because they just want to make it look district. bad? They don't want to let him, you know, have a success? I mean, I think they are not bringing forth solutions. But do you think they're the name of it is solutions. a little misleading? It, it, because the, the only thing is the no. Congressional Budget Office says it would have a negligible effect on inflation, although it did lower prices, and I agree those are all good so, things. Does it really so affect? It does. I will point you to 126 economists who have said this is going to be a change, uh, a change maker. It's going to have effect on inflation. It's going to lower costs for Americans. Man, just just talk your way through it, man. Just keep babbling your way through it. And I love how the people on the view are just treating, treating her with kid gloves. You know, it's not going to lower inflation, but but, you know, there's some people who are just mean to you. They're just they're just so mean. It's just so nasty. Meanwhile, Corinne Jean-Pierre also said that Joe Biden understands how much inflation is crushing families. No, he does not. He clearly does not. He went on 60 Minutes like a week ago and basically suggested that it was no big deal that inflation was up in the food markets like 13% year over year. But here's Corinne Jean-Pierre trying to walk back the Joe Biden as, as sympathetic, empathetic leader. Here's, here's the thing about Joe Biden. When he came into office, his entire shtick was he's friendly grandpa. Right? He's mildly senile, but, but friendly. He at least, he, he likes you, right? I mean, yeah, he's sniffing your hair, but he does give you nice toys and He's kind of like a decent old gent, even if he wanders into walls sometimes. That was kind of the pitch for Joe Biden. And then Afghanistan happened when it became absolutely clear he did not care how many Afghans were going to be shoved into black bags and into the basement if they were female or simply murdered if they had once worked with the United States. And everybody went, oh, this guy's kind of a jackass. And they've never been able to, to quite get out of that. This is why Joe Biden's approval rating has plummeted, because the actual image of him among the American public changed radically 
during the Afghanistan debacle. And here, so here's Karine Jean Pierre trying to pretend that Joe Biden is some sort of sympathetic, empathetic figure. He is not. Going into the midterms, how can the president assure Americans he feels their pain and has a plan to help? So the president understands that when it comes to the economy, he understands how much that's crushing families. He gets it that people are sitting around their kitchen table and trying to figure out how are they going to pay for their groceries. And so that's why he's made that his number one economic priority. He's made it his number one economic priority. And the way he's going to fight this is by taking this giant sack of money and just pouring it all over the place. He's going to basically create one of those game show thingamajiggers where it, it, it's essentially like a hurricane machine, but he's going to pour cash in it. And you're going to go in there. You're going to dance around, try to grab as much of that cash as you can. And that's going to be how he fights inflation. It's going to be amazing. Meanwhile, Ronald Klain is trying to talk his way through it. He was meeting with the, the Jokers over at the Atlantic, which has completely blown out its own credibility. And, and he says, you know, when we took over, people were lined up for food. They were at like food lines. Yes, because of COVID. Because of COVID and the end of COVID had nothing to do with you, literally nothing. You maintained the COVID stance until today. Here is Ron Klain. We had to address the problems that we found. Right. And the biggest problems that we found were a country with a pandemic that was killing, uh, you know, thousands, literally thousands of people a day, uh, hundreds of thousands of cases a day when we arrived. And so we had to ramp up the response to that. And then the economic consequences of that. Uh, it's easy to forget that when Joe Biden came to office, we turn on the TV at night, people were in line uh, in football stadiums waiting for a box of food. The unemployment rate was nearly 10 percent. We had 20 million people out, out of work and, uh, and businesses closed and schools closed. So we needed an economic response that addressed that. Oh, did you? Did you? It seems like your economic response has made things a hell of a lot worse in terms of inflation. Meanwhile, Janet Yellen, who admits that she completely blew inflation, right? Same, she's at the same conference with the Atlantic. These are the people that the Biden administration talks to. They would never answer a critical question in any serious way. So they decided that they would hang out with Ronald Brownstein over at the Atlantic and answer questions about inflation. So Janet Yellen, who may or may not be a cast member of, uh, of Amazon's Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power as, as a Harfoot. I don't, I don't maybe, maybe not. A anyway, Janet Yellen, she says inflation is going to go down in 2023. You should trust her because she's been so good at this in the past. And if it doesn't, it's somebody else's fault probably. Do you see a possibility that inflation will be essentially under control by the end of next year before we are full on into the presidential race? Or is this something we're still going to be dealing with in a serious way into 2024? Well, I, I, I believe it's going to come down certainly next year, although let's be clear, there are risks. Um, the mm -hmm. Russian invasion of Ukraine hasn't come to an end. Um, we're seeing uh, Putin weaponize oil and gas um, in fighting this war. So um, we remain vulnerable to supply shocks. Oh, so so it'll, it'll, it'll heal, but if it doesn't, it's somebody else's fault. How can you, here's the, here's the real truth of it. The truth is that Democrats, in the end, they love these policies. And so they don't care if the reality is inflation and stagnation. I mean, they're saving the planet. Nancy Pelosi says it herself. The Speaker of the House said yesterday, guys, we're saving the planet. When you're saving the planet, it doesn't matter if there's a little inflation or high unemployment or misery. None of that, man. She's saving the planet. This geriatric daughter is saving the planet. I mean, when I think of people who save the planet, I think like Superman, the prophets, Nancy Pelosi. We extended subsidies for three more years for lower costs for, for the Affordable Care Act. And we saved the planet. We're saving the planet with record $360 billion dollars to save the planet and generating jobs and cleaner air and cleaner water and jobs and security for our country. She saved the planet, guys. She saved the planet. Okay, the, the, you, I guess you can tell yourself you, you saved the planet when you define saving the planet internally. And again, reality matters absolutely nothing to you. All righty, guys, the rest of the show is continuing. Now you're not going to want to miss it. We will be joined by Matt Walsh a little bit later on to talk about his crusade against Vanderbilt University transing the children. If you're not a member,